We've now seen graphically how price changes give rise to income and substitution effects that together determine the new optimal consumption bundle. Next we're going to ask how can we actually calculate that? And we'll start with the example that we used when we first illustrated how to calculate an optimal consumption bundle for a consumer. In that example, we assume that income is 500, the price of good 1 is 50, and the price of good 2 is 25. We also assumed that the underlying map of indifference curves can be represented by the utility function x1 times x2. Of course, there are lots of other utility functions that could represent that same map of indifference curves, but this one's easy to work with. So now suppose that the price of good 1 increases to 72. We know how to illustrate this in the graph. If all you buy is good x2, you'd still be able to buy exactly the same as you did before. But if all you did was buy x1, you wouldn't be able to buy as much. You'd now be able to, be, to buy 500 divided by 72, which is about 6.94. So we're going to assume that you can consume fractions of this good. So somewhere over here, there's the horizontal intercept. And so we get a new budget constraint that's steeper and looks like this. Now, we then decomposed the change in behavior into an income and substitution effect. So we started with a substitution effect, and we imagined that someone gives this consumer enough money so that she's just as happy as she was originally. Originally, she reached the indifference curve that we're going to label UA, the indifference curve that contains bundle A. So let's redraw that indifference curve. She's equally happy all along that indifference curve. But now prices have changed, so the budget has a steeper slope. We're going to take that budget and move it parallel until it's tangent to that indifference curve. So we're going to fit the same slope as the magenta budget to this indifference curve, and that gave us point B. And the movement from A to B was our substitution effect. So before we set up the math problem, Let's just see what hap what's happening here. What we're doing is we're finding the smallest possible budget that would get us to this indifference curve. We could imagine that you initially try to guess how much is required, and initially you give some budget like this, and then you realize, whoa, I've given too much. So you keep decreasing that until you get to the smallest possible budget. That's how we set up the math problem. We say what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the minimum budget. So you're trying to find the minimum budget where the budget is given by how much you spend on good 1, which is now 72 times x1, plus how much you spend on good 2, which is 25 times x2. So just the price of good 1 times x1 times x1 plus the price of good 2 times x2. That's how much you're going to spend to reach this point, and you're going to choose an x1 and an x2. You're going to consume the consumption bundle that does that in the least costly way possible, the lowest possible budget that can get you to reach this indifference curve. So we're going to try to minimize this expenditure subject to the constraint that we must end on that indifference curve. So subject to the constraint that our utility, which is given by x1 times x2, is equal to this ua. So what's ua? ua is the label on this indifference curve that's given to it by this utility function. And we can calculate what that is, because we know that the point 5, 10 lies on this indifference curve. So all we have to do is substitute 5 in for x1 and 10 in for x2, that's 5 times 10, and that gives us the label on this indifference curve. 5 times 10 is 50. So this indifference curve has the label of 50 when we measure utility using this utility function. 
So we can replace now this UA with a 50. So what we've set up is an optimization problem, except now it's a minimization problem instead of a maximization problem. When we first calculated bundle A, we said we want to maximize the utility subject to the budget constraint. Now the constraint is that we have to get to this indifference curve. So that's our constraint. And we're trying to minimize how much we spend in order to get you to that indifference curve. So it's just another optimization problem. And the same method we used to calculate the optimal consumption bundle is going to work to calculate this bundle B. So how did we do that? Well, we set up a Lagrange function. That Lagrange function had two components. The first component is that thing we're trying to optimize. In the case of the utility maximization problem, that was the utility function. But now we're trying to minimize the expenditure, so that's the first thing that appears in the Lagrangian. 72 times x1 plus 25 times x2. And the second part is a lambda, the Lagrange multiplier, times the constraint with all the terms collected to one side. So we can subtract x1, x2 from both sides, and we get 50 minus x1, x2. So we're doing exactly the same thing we did when we did the utility maximization problem. Put what you're optimizing here, and then lambda times the constraint with everything collected to one side of the equation. Then we took three partial derivatives. The partial derivative of the Lagrangian with, with respect to x1, with respect to x2, and with respect to lambda. So when we do that, we take the derivative of this with respect to x1. So we've got an x1 here. When we take the derivative of this, we're just left with 72. This doesn't have an x1, so when we take the derivative, it just goes away. Lambda times 50 doesn't have an x1, so when we take the derivative of that, it just goes away. And then we have an x1 here, so we have a minus lambda x1, x2. When we take the derivative of that, we get minus lambda times x2. We just leave the x2 alone because we're not differentiating with respect to x2. The derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x2 is similarly 25 minus, and we've got another x2 here, so minus lambda times x1 times x2. We're differentiating with respect to x2, so lambda x1 with the x2 gone because we've differentiated it away. Then finally, we differentiate with respect to lambda, and that just gives us back what's in the parentheses here, 50 minus x1, x2. The next thing we did is we set all of those to zero. So we set this to zero, set this to zero, and set this to zero. These are called our first order conditions. And now we have three equations and three unknowns. The unknowns are x1, x2, and lambda. We don't really care about the lambda, so the lambda is what we're going to get rid of first. We're going to use these two equations. We're going to just take the negative terms to the other side. So we get 72 is equal to lambda times x2, and 25 is equal to lambda times x1. Then we divide the equations by each other, and that cancels out the lambdas. And so we get x2 divided by x1 is equal to 72 divided by 25. We can then solve for x2. So x2 is just going to be equal to 72 divided by 25 times x1, which is multiplied by x1 on both sides. And when you divide 72 by 25, you get 2.88. So x2 is equal to 
times x1. Now we have an expression for x2 just in terms of x1, which we can substitute into this equation. So we're just going to substitute that into here and get 50 minus x1 times 2.88 times x1 is equal to 0. We're taking that to the other side and multiplying through, we get 50 is equal to 2.88 times x1 squared. Divide both sides by 2.88 and take the square root. So we're going to divide by 2.88 and then take the square root of everything. And what we get is x1 is equal to 4.166 with the 6 continuing to repeat. So now we found the x1 component of the b point. This component here is 4.166 with the 6 repeating. Now we can get x2 by just plugging this x1 back into this equation. So x2 is equal to 2.88 times x1, but x1 is 4.166. So times 4.166, where that 6 continues to repeat. And when we multiply that out, that gives us exactly 12. So now we found the second component of the B point. It's 12. So now we can complete this picture up here. We could put the substitution effect in here. That gives us point B. And we now know point B has a consumption level of 12 for x2 and this 4.16 with 6 repeating for x1. The final thing we could ask is how much is it actually going to cost for us to reach bundle B? So what does that compensated budget, the blue budget, have to be? So the compensated budget It's just what that bundle costs us. 72 times the x1 plus 25 times the x2. So 72 times 4.166 with the 6 repeating plus 25 times 12. And when we work that out, that's equal to 600. We started with an income of 500. So you would have to give this consumer an additional $100 to be able to reach bundle B. That's the level of compensation that's required. So now we've calculated the substitution effect. And of course, we already know how to calculate where we're going to end up on the final magenta budget. We just do another optimization problem. We maximize the utility subject to the new constraint with the new price. That gives us the new tangency that we're going to end up at, this new tangency, which in this case, because this is a utility function that's homothetic, would put us right here. Looks like it's 10, but it's not. It's not actually 10. So that's all there's to it.